whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Woo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if you believe Jesus is the Christ, you're born of God. It means you're a child of God. Yes. And once you become a child of a father, you're the child of a father. So whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves who, him who is begotten of him. So anybody that loves God must also love Jesus or they don't really love God. Amen. Make sense? Yeah. If, you have a, if you have a friend here in the earth who says, well, I sure, I sure like your father, but I don't like you. <laughs> they don't really like the father. Because yeah. you know the father loves the son. Right. Even if the son is a little off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in this case, the son is not off. Whoever believes Jesus is the Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who's begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Keep that in mind. We'll get back to keeping commandments equaling the love of God. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. That means we born again people overcome the world. Hallelujah. The world can't squish us. The world can't stop us. The world can't do anything to us. Amen. We're separate from the world, mutually exclusive from the world. We dominate the world. We're over the world. We overcome the world. Amen. Nothing of the world should be able to drown us. Amen. Right? Amen. That's how Jesus walked on the water. He walked on top of everything of the world. Yes. And we can too. Who is he that overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Skip down here to verse 10. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he's not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. Yeah. Now I think we mentioned eternal life the other day. Zoe. Was that on a Sunday? We mentioned Zoe. <coughs> Z-O-E. Z-O-E. Zoe. Zoe is the nature of God imparted into the human spirit. Eternal life is the nature of God imparted into the human spirit. Hallelujah. And it's, it's the thing that allows you to overcome sense knowledge. Sense knowledge has stunted Christianity, and that's all the world has. Spirit knowledge is what God gave us via Zoe, eternal life, the nature of God. Yeah. This, uh, think of it this way, forgiveness of sins can't change the human nature. So Jesus did more than give us forgiveness of sins. The cross brought us more than just erasing your past. Mm -hmm. It brought us a new nature. Mm -hmm. right. Glory. Jesus brought us a new nature. That new nature uh, causes thieves to get honest. Yeah. That new nature causes dark to come, become light. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. Changes habits. Drunks get sober. Yeah. Amen. Criminals become preachers. Right. Why is that? Is that just forgiveness of sins? No, that's a new nature. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He made him who knew no sin. He made Jesus who knew no sin. He never right. sinned. Right. To become sin. For us. He turned Jesus into sin on the cross so that we, sinners, could be made the righteousness of God Amen. in Him. We are made, turned into the righteousness of God. What is the righteousness of God? It's Herb here. It's Patty. What is the righteousness? It's me. Are you saying you're righteous? No, I'm saying God turned me into His righteousness. Yeah. That we might be made or become the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. If there's anything right about God, it's us. Right. It's Jesus, but it's us in Jesus. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. E.W. Kenyon made a statement, and of course people hate him still today for it. He said, our righteousness is as good as Jesus' righteousness. That's true. Because it is His righteousness. Amen. Jesus did it all right, and then He said, I'm giving myself to you. Amen. You can be in me, and I'll be in you, and we'll just be one. You approach the Father in me, and it's just as good as me approaching the Father. That's why Jesus could say, 
You don't have to ask me anything in that day. You can ask the Father directly, for the Father Himself loves you because you've loved me. Jesus is our mediator. He, he's the one between us and God. He's how we approach God. You cannot approach God without Jesus, right. without right. the blood of Jesus. You can't approach without your mediator. That's right. So we're certainly not saying that we're all just right in our own accord. No. We're certainly not just saying that uh, my righteousness gets better and better and better. You cannot improve your righteousness. That's right. That's right. You and I cannot improve on how right we really are with God. Amen. Are you saying we can't be better Christian? I didn't say you couldn't be better. I said, but you cannot be better righteousness. You cannot get better righteousness by being better. You can do better things and you can be a better Christian and you can be more disciplined and all those things, but that doesn't make you more right with God. Amen. Miss, Mr. New Christian over here is just as right as Mr. Old Christian over here. Just as right. Just as accepted, just as son of God, just as called, just as special. Right. Has the same amount of eternal life inside. That's right. Glory. Thank you, Lord. And this is very important. That God has given us eternal life, this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. Zoe, life, eternal life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So if you have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you have eternal life. Amen. And if you don't have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you do not have eternal life. So no Muslim has eternal life until they receive Jesus as the Son of God. And that's why when you're talking to a Muslim, you have to get to that point. Because they believe in Jesus but they will not admit he has, that he's the Son of God. They say, no, God has no Son. That's their, that's their doctrine, is that God has no Son. They don't have eternal life. Not the same God. Allah, God, not the same. Right. Moon God is Allah, not the same as the one true God. That's right. right? No religion. Even if they believe in God and do good things, without the Son, none of them have, right. have life. That's right. Not even a Jew. Not even a Jewish person who believes in God and the whole Old Testament, without Jesus, they do not have eternal life. That means if they die today, they split hell wide open. That's right, that's right. Without the Son, there is no life. That's right, that's right. Jesus explained this mm -hmm. Himself to the Jews. And that's why we continue to preach to the Jews. Until they reject, then we shake the dust, and then hopefully somebody else can get them later. Verse 13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe on the name of the Son of God. This is a very uh, pivotal scripture for a lot of people here or at least in us proving to people who need to be proved to. Notice it says, these things have I written to you who believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Notice how positive that is. Mm -hmm. That you may hope? No. no. That you may wish? No. That you might no. have eternal life? No, that you may know. No. So all these things that explain salvation, he's written so that you can know you have eternal life. Yes. Why is that important? Because so many people don't know. Right. So many people are unsure if they have eternal life. They've been taught wrong. They never have delved into the scripture. For whatever reason, people are unsure if they're saved or not. Even some that believe in Jesus. Matter of fact, over in another country, and this, this is around the world, we, we always run into this in churches and amongst Christians who aren't sure if they're saved. How do we know? Because we say, if you die today, would you go to? Well, I don't know. Well, do you, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus. When did you receive him as your Savior? Well, you know, when I was whatever year, 10 years ago, two weeks ago, two months ago. Oh, well, then you have, well, how can anybody know? How can anybody know if you're saved? Because it says that you can know you have eternal life. You're supposed to be able to know that you have eternal life, not hope that you have eternal life. Well, don't you have to continue to be good? No, 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 that's not what it says. That's not what it says. You have to realize that all the instructions that Jesus gave us through the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, all the commands in the New Testament that help us do good, be good, act right, not act wrong, think right, not think wrong, all of the instructional commands the Holy Spirit gave us in the New Testament are not designed to cause you to be saved. Right. 
or to get you salvation or keep you saved. None of those instructions are designed to keep you saved. Amen. Your salvation is not always hanging in the balance. I'm doing good, so I'm over here. I'm not doing so good. Uh, have I sinned too many times? I sure hope not. Oh, I sure hope not. You understand that? But people, for, for some reason, they forget the, the very foundation of what salvation is through faith. And they keep wanting it to be salvation through faith plus works. I'm glad you asked. Oh, wait. We didn't have a question. <laughs> Go to Ephesians 2. You need to see it for your own, own eye, with your own eyes. And if you don't, if you don't understand this or get this, uh, you, will, you will not be a very happy Christian and it will show on your face and in your doctrine and in your treatment of others. And you'll be a finger pointer. You'll be a judger of people. You'll be a condemner because you who judge do the same things. So if you don't understand grace and righteousness and salvation by faith alone and not by works, then you will end up condemning people because you feel condemned. That's the nature of what sin does. It causes you to not be happy with yourself and take it out on others. Right. Thou that judges doest the same things. Right? So if you find yourself finger pointing, it's your pro you have the problem. All right. If you find yourself unable to have mercy on people, you got a problem. You're mad at yourself. And you're trying to penalize everybody along with you. Amen. It's the truth. It's the truth. Preachers that harp on sin all the time tell people how bad they are. They got problems. They're mad at themselves is what they're mad at. They're feeling guilty themselves is what they're feeling guilty about. It's the truth. I have no, in my mind, I have no uh, name of anybody in mind. I'm not thinking of anybody. It's just the nature of what judging does. Yeah. Or the nature of where it comes from. Mm -hmm. right. Ephesians 2. Verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, or in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. So while you were terrible, he made you alive. He didn't make you get good to make you alive. While you were dead and in trespasses, He made you alive. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. With Christ. In parentheses, it says, by grace you've been saved. That's what, grace, that's what salvation grace is. Is that when you didn't deserve it, you got it. Hallelujah. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. So this salvation grace or this saving grace now is going to show you the riches of it. In his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you Lord. Some Christians still feel like they're under the gun every day with God. Oh no. You're under the kindness every day with God. He's trying to show you his kindness not his pistol. <laughs> Really? Really? You're going to treat God like, a, like a, a good child would treat a parent. Respectfully, honorably. You're not going to run all around like a rebellious kid. Certainly not. But a good kid in a good family expects kindness from his, his father and his parents. And it's such a wonderful household. That's how God is with us. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That means by a free gift, you have been saved through believing. Thank you, Lord. you showed up and picked up your gift. That's how you got saved. Hallelujah. Yeah. You didn't earn your, earn your gift. You, you picked it up. I showed up and picked up my gift because I believed what they said, that I had a gift behind door number one. I went and picked up my gift. Hallelujah. All, they said all I had to do was accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God and my Savior and that I would get a gift. And so I did that and I got my gift. What gift? My gift of salvation. Yeah. Eternal life from now and forever. Hallelujah. Thank, Thank you, Lord. For by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. That means it's not about how good yourself is. Well, that's right. Not of yourselves. 
I was just in a conversation recently with somebody who didn't understand this. And they kept saying, but, but you can't sin. And I kept saying, or what? <laughs> or you lose your salvation? So, like if I sin, I'm not saved anymore. And if I repent, then I'm saved again. And if I, if I, if I blow it again, then I'm not saved anymore. <laughs> and then I'm in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. I never know. He's like, yeah. I'm like, you're wrong. Amen. I said, you don't understand the Bible at all. That's right. I said, I told him straight up. I said, so right now, do you have eternal life? And he said, yeah. I said, that means you never sin? Right. I'm like, you're a liar. He said, well, you know, I repent. And so I said, so you're a better Christian than other people who aren't such good. Yeah. I said, I said, you're in trouble, man. You don't understand the great, you don't understand anything about salvation. And I quoted him some scripture and he walked off saying, well, I'm going to have to study that. For by grace, you have been saved not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not how good yourself can be. And so you need to recognize you don't get saved that way. Obviously, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that. But sometimes people think they stay saved by yourselves. Isn't that right? Over in Galatians, remember what he said? He said, you foolish Galatians. He said, you, how did you get saved? By, by faith or by works? He said, you think you're going to get saved by faith and then improve your salvation by works? How would you get the Holy Spirit? By believing or by works? He said, how can you improve your salvation by the flesh? Remember that? We think that we're saved now. Now I'm going to do some flesh things. Stop, stop doing wrong things. Start doing good things so that I can improve my, my salvation. <coughs> I know you're all we're quiet. You're thinking, wait, did he say that right? Did he say that right? This in there, Galatians 3, I think. It is the gift of God. So, by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. What does that mean? That's what that guy was doing. He was boasting, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm better. I'm, you know, I pray more. I go to church more. I, I don't do as many sins as everybody else. Stop boasting. That's right. That's right. And I know that you would never say that out loud. But don't in your mind say those things. Don't think to yourself, well, I'm, I'm probably doing better than that row. <laughs> Or you're in a conversation with someone and, 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 and you recognize they have a lifestyle that's a little looser maybe than yours and you walk away thinking, I'm better than them. <laughs> Don't do that. Right. It's a gift. How do you get the gift? You show up. Right. How do you get the gift? You believe it. Yeah. How do you get the blessing? You believe. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And then somebody has this, you know, they're kind of stuck in this, so you believe in once saved, always saved? Well, there's no scripture that says once saved, always saved. Period. Is there? No. So don't, don't use that term to describe who's a what and, and categorize where people fit. Uh, we're, we're reading here, what causes salvation is believing. That's right, that's right. And it's definite so that you can know you have eternal life. I don't have to question. I don't have to wonder through my Christianity, right. do, do I have eternal life or not? Do I have eternal life or not? Sure hope I didn't. Oh, I've neglected my Bible reading. Is it, is it too long? Have I, if I go 31 days without reading my Bible, have I lost it? Well, you might have lost your Bible, <laughs> but you haven't lost your salvation. So the way we explain it is this. If you got saved by faith alone, not of works, how do you stay saved? By faith alone and not of works. Okay? So as long as you really keep believing the rest of your life, you'll go to heaven, straight, he straight to heaven. You'll never lose your salvation if you keep believing the rest of your life. If you ever stop believing in Jesus and then reject Him, you could give up your salvation, but you won't accidentally lose it. Well, I, I accidentally... 
Where did I put that? Huh. I thought I had my salvation. It won't happen that way. You would have to uh, neglect God on purpose, reject Jesus from your heart. Only God would know that. Only you and God would actually know that. So you could give it up because it's all based on your heart and it's belief. Even if in a time of desperation you, you were so mad and you said, God, I don't even believe anymore. That doesn't mean you lost your salvation because God knows what you really believe. However, I would say that certain people and some people have given it up. Certain people have stopped believing, have rejected Christ. They gave it up. So in a sense, I believe once saved, always saved, sure. But not that you could never give it up. I just believe that you could never sin one too many times to lose it. I do believe you could sin one too many times and harden your heart so much that you would then reject. That's the danger of sin. That's the danger of continuing in sin. You just get so hard and that kind of separates your mind from God. You feel guilty for so long and you get so hateful in your heart, even towards God, that eventually you finally just have your conscience seared where it can't feel anything and you're like, well, forget it all. That could happen to people and that's the danger of sin. Oh, that's one of the dangers of sin. You with me? But you can't use sin as a threat to people to lose their salvation. And this is where the pulpits long ago and then some around the world still, probably some in America still, they still keep using the pulpit to threaten people so that people will keep living right. What is the threat? The threat is if you keep sinning, you better watch out. God might just send you to hell. <laughs> And so the Christian's like, oh no, oh, they're scared of God, they don't know how to act and how to live, and they're not happy. That's not how you help people. That's, right. That's not how you train Christians, okay, with a threat for their sins. No, you can't do it that way. <clears throat> okay, now go back to 1 John. Just, just a little refresher so that you never fall into the rut that I've seen others fall into. All right, let's read uh, 1 John 4, verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, the Antichrist and the spirit of the world and all that, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Yeah. Now that can be a life-changing scripture once you recognize that you got the big one in you. God himself is in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. Jesus is in you. They are of the world... Therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. Amen. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. That's, right. That's an interesting scripture. We won't teach it around it now. But Verse 7, Beloved, beloved let us love one another for God, for, excuse me, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So now we're going to, uh, tie this eternal life to loving one another. All right? He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now this word love is agape love. It's the God kind of love. It's supernatural love. It's divine love. It's not just sensual love. When he says love one another, he's not talking about the sensual type. Right. Where somebody's fun and you're like, oh, I just love them. Right, that's right. Or the type that, where you love your cat. <laughs> Or your dog. I just love my dog. My dog so I just love my dog. I love my, I, love my, I love my wife. I just love my wife. No, no, no. Agape loves deeper and different. And you can't agape your dog. <laughs> what you're feeling is sensual feelings, emotional feelings. Separate that from the love of God, which is... This spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection. 
They're, they're already mad at me. I, I, I do. I think I got. I got it in my dog. I think. <laughs> maybe. Okay. Maybe. But if you just saw it. <laughs> Some people are trying to agape their pets so much they've forgotten to agape their neighbor. They're so highly committed to their pet they forgot to be highly committed to the humans around them. Verse 9. In this the love of God was manifested toward up. Just, just open it. Let them hear the. this might be the scripture they need. In this the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Hallelujah. Go back to 1 John 3. Verse 20, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. So you don't want your heart condemning you. Whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Now, pleasing in His sight. Now, if you put a period right there, it's like, wait, okay, we've got to do things that are pleasing or, or what? Or it won't get a prayer answered. But we've already explained how there's, a, there's an antidote for disobedience. All right? Verse 23, and this is His commandment. So if you keep His commandments, do those things that are pleasing, then you get your prayer answered. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son Jesus. Notice how it starts off. What's the commandment these days? This is the commandment that He's speaking of. This is the, and this is His commandment. Believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. That's right. That's See how important love is? As He gave His commandment. Now He who keep. remember earlier we said keep His commandments equals the love of God. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments. What commandments? These main ones. The main ones are believe, have faith, and love. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he's given to us. Hallelujah. Yeah. Just a couple more. Verse, go to chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3. Verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Yeah. That's a big scripture right there. Yeah. How loving of the Father to call us ch children of God. That we should be called children of God. That's love. Yeah. To call us children. To, to adopt a child just of your own volition. What love? Just to decide to love somebody and call them your child. What a big deal there. Amen. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. That's why the world doesn't understand this. Beloved, now we are the children of God. It's not been revealed what we shall be, but we know when He's revealed we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in himself purifies himself just as he is pure. Then it says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there's no sin. So that's a good benchmark, right? Makes you feel clean when you read that part, doesn't it? That's where, that's where our consciousness should always be. In him there's no sin, and he has purified us. He took away our sins. Verse 6, whoever abides in Him, that's us, does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen Him nor known Him. And this is where it gets tricky. <laughs> but I'm going to clarify it, okay? Because Christians stumble over this all the time, and, and, walk, and, and if they stop there, they go away feeling guilty. 
Wait a second. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. Oh my. What about last week? Was I of the devil last week? Or last year for some of you? Most of you have probably sinned in 2016. What do you do with that? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> well, first of all, you can't just take this one little passage and end your doctrine. Amen. All Scripture must be interpreted in light of other Scripture. It all has to fit together Amen. for it to make sense. So, let's look at verse 7 and... Little children, who, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Does that mean that someone who doesn't believe in Jesus, that does righteous, is righteous? Does that mean that a Buddhist who is doing such good as he could, so, doing so many righteous deeds, is he referring to that type of a person? No. That if you do righteous, you're righteous? No. no. He, he is setting a high benchmark that we righteous people ought to be righteous. We ought to have righteous acts. Verse 8, he who sins is of the devil. Does that mean every time you sin you're of the devil? That can't be. That just can't be. Verse 9, whoever has been born of God does not sin. If you're born of God, you do not sin. Does that mean that you've never sinned since you became a Christian? No. Then does that mean that you're not of God? No. What is, how do you put this together? We're getting there. <laughs> Whoever's been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. If you're born of God, you cannot sin. That's right. Woohoo! Does that mean you can live your life like you want to? No. Because you're born of God, it doesn't, then, then everything you do is not a sin? No. Well, that didn't make any sense either. So how do you reconcile? Okay, this is the best way to understand it, and then I'll read a couple of scriptures. When it talks about he who sins is of the devil, whoever's been born of God does not sin, it's talking about sin willingly from your spirit man, not flesh sin, not flesh habits, not flesh lifestyle, but sin from the heart, which is this deep rejection of Christ, or deep in your face disobedience to God. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. Kind of like Ananias and Sapphira, they did some deep lying to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now that's a whole other story, but we're talking about sinning from the heart, sinning from your spirit man. How do you know if you're sinning from your spirit man? You'll know. Because you won't feel guilty for what you did and you will be in your face against God. And that's not the type of sins sincere Christians are committing. So sincere Christians will never commit this sin. Sincere Christians will never sin from their heart. You with me? You may slip up, you may get into a time of temptation, but you're not sinning from your heart. So you're not of the devil and you're not losing salvation and it's not proving that you're not saved. Yeah, but I wanted to do it. No, you, deep down you really didn't want to do it. Deep down you'd prefer to obey God. Deep down you felt convicted. It's your flesh that wanted to. It's your mind that wanted to and you gave in to it. But don't, don't walk off thinking, well, I'm not of God. I'm not born of God. I'm a, I'm a sinner now. I'm probably going to hell. You don't need to feel that way. Amen. You do need to be more sincere. You do need to get some things straight. And that's why this whole book of 1 John starts off this way. Speaking to Christians, go back to 1 John chapter 1. Remember, he said if you're born of God, you don't sin. I say he's talking about a deep sin from the heart sin. Not just an accidental, well, I lied to somebody or I got rude at work and I had to repent. See the difference? How do I know? Because over here, he's saying if you're born of God, you don't sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we've not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. This is John talking about himself. He's saying we. So John's admitting that even Christians sin. It doesn't mean you're not born of God. So there's got to be a difference here. You with me? There's just got to be an a, a, a inherent difference in this, in this book. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. So he's writing to the children. What children? The children of God. I'm writing these things so you don't sin. He doesn't want us to sin. He's not saying you'll never sin, even though the other scripture said... What did it say? Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he's been born of God. That has to be different than this one. I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Does that help at all? Yes. Your salvation is secure. Your status in heaven is secure. You're a child of God. As long as you're sincere. As long as, you're, as long as you care. As long as you want to be a child of God through Jesus Christ, you are one. Amen. And I'm, I'm telling you these things so that you don't sin. I'm telling you these things so that you don't sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Amen. Verse 7. Or verse 5. 1 John 1 verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. That's a, I love this part. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If you want to feel cleansed from all sin, okay, I'm about to wrap it up here. If you want to feel cleansed from all sin by the blood of Jesus, walk in the light. The more you walk in the light, the more you feel it all. If, if you say you have fellowship, but you don't walk in the light, that means you, that means you drift away into caring, uh, to carelessness, you're in darkness. Your, your lifestyle doesn't change at all. You just won't experience the good stuff. That's right. yeah. That's right. You won't experience the blood of Jesus cleansing you from all sin. You'll, you'll walk around with guilt all the time. Deep down, you'll be convicted all the time. Uh -huh. And you won't want to have fellowship with one another. So this is a good, listen, this is a good uh, uh, measuring tool for you that if you don't want to have fellowship, it, that if you don't desire to be around Christians and have fellowship with Christians, you're slipping over into darkness. That's an evidence. It's a measuring tool for you. It's a barometer, a thermometer, whatever you want to call it. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If you don't feel any brotherly love feelings toward Christians, you're drifting. You're in the shadows. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, yes. There's something very powerful that many people never experience, that, that even Christians sometimes never experience. It's this, it's this reality of the agape <laughs> love of God where you look at a human soul and you just either smile or your heart breaks with compassion or all the spiritual truth just comes out. I was talking with Brother Chris on the trip, and he said, you know, people think that I'm just kind of real hyper and extroverted running around talking to people. He said, but it's not that. He said, something happened to me last year, and it's, it's that I love people. The love of God happened to me, and so I just think of them, and I want to, I care so deeply that I have to share Christ with them. Amen. Many Christians have never felt that. I encourage you to ask the Lord for that. Amen. If you've never felt it, I encourage you to ask the Lord. It'll change your whole life. If you've had trouble sharing your faith or really wanting to talk about Jesus uh, or not really caring enough about people and you're always madder than you should be a, a, a about people, if you're mad at sinners rather than compassionate, 
I, I, I challenge you to ask God to give you some deep agape love for people. Okay? I, it happened to me. I remember the moment. I remember the moment that I, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, walking into my office building about 745 uh, in 1996. And as I'm walking into the building, I'm thinking to myself, God, I have a lot of faith. And it's just my, this is my first year in the Lord. And I've been studying and learning. God, I have a lot of faith. I, I know I do. And I have a lot of hope. I can feel the hope. I said, Lord, but I don't. I don't know if I have the love of God. I don't think I have quite the love of God that I need. Will you give me more love? And that was it. I prayed the prayer. Within a few weeks, I, something changed in me, and I could tell. I could tell that something changed because I, I would be walking down the sidewalk, and I remember doing this in the office, walking down the sidewalk outside or even in the hallway, and I would see people, and I would just think, Oh, God, are they okay? Oh, have mercy on humans. Have you ever felt that way? Have mercy on humans. I'm not talking about just in some tragedy on the news. I'm talking about just mercy on your fellow man. How about mercy on your enemy? How about mercy on your boss? The world builds this whole, you know, attack plateau against their boss. They're, you know, they're always... But not Christians. No, no, we... Even for those above us, it's like, oh, I can, oh, yeah, yeah. E even though maybe you don't do everything I want you to do, I have mercy on you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We want our leaders and bosses to be so perfect. Why don't you start having some mercy? Yeah. <laughs> Husbands and wives, why don't you start having some mercy? You want your spouse to be perfect? I mean, you got these expectations that they got to be perfect. I want a perfect spouse. <laughs> I deserve a perfect spouse. Why don't you start having some mercy? Stop being so hateful. Why don't you start having some agape love, which would never speak evil or say anything to hurt? See, you're 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 dealing with the fact that you, you don't really you're not really walking in the love of God because you don't care about your fellow man. That's the whole deal: is to care about your fellow man, to care about your neighbor, to care about your person in the house with you, care about their feelings. Love would never speak ill, never hurt any, and love would never worketh ill to a neighbor. Or a spouse. So wives, it would be completely against the agape love of God to be hateful towards your husband and speak harshly. Husbands, it would be completely against the agape love of God to never talk to your wife. To, to withhold that which she needs. And vice versa. So maybe your homework assignment is to read the whole first John. All chat, one through five. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. More information about Stevenson Ministries and Houston Faith Church is available online at HoustonFaith.tv. Chaz and Joni Stevenson are the pastors of a dynamic, growing church in Houston, Texas, and have a New Testament vision of preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit, helping people get saved, and building strong Christians who can impact their world. Houston Faith Church is a place where the love of God is real, where lives are changed, and where followers of Jesus become fishers of men.